Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. Everyone, it's uh, Roxanne Durhodge of Authentic Living with Roxanne. Thanks for tuning in again. Uh, today, I have a young man that I met not too long ago. He was uh, the MC at an event uh, that I spoke at, and I had the privilege of seeing him with his funky silver jacket and, and uh, entertaining the crowd. So it's uh, thank you, Shane, for coming on today. Shane, Malcolm, Hi. how are you today? Good. Thanks for having me. Okay, so Shane uh, has... Um, done a lot of uh, pretty interesting things um, in leadership. So he is the executive director of Leadership Niagara and has been uh, in, the, in that leadership role since 2016. Um, he does, uh, he helps organizations through things like brand development, uh, governance reform, um, and she's worked with nonprofits uh, just overall for, um, for about 10 years. You've worked in that capacity. And he's recognized as a community leader who's passionate about transportation, the youth voice, inclusion and diversity uh, with communities. Uh, he is presently part of, um, assists on the boards of the St. Catharines Club, the Boys and Girls Club of Niagara, and the Paris board member of the Greater uh, Chamber of Commerce and the past chair of Next Niagara Council. He's also won uh, several awards and uh, the Niagara College Distinguished Alumni Award in 2018, the Ontario's Premier Award in 17, and the recipient of the 40 Under 40 Business Achievement Award and the 2018 Pride Niagara ED Eldred Award winner. He's from uh, Montego Bay, so he's from the, my part of the woods that I grew up with, and uh, he lives here, and we're fortunate to have him here in Niagara, where I'm also from. So Shane, is there anything that I missed that you'd like to highlight? Because I know you've done so much in, in a short period of time, I would say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, I've only been with not-for-profits for about six years altogether. Um, Leadership Niagara has been around since 2007, um, but I stepped in in an acting role in 2016 um for a couple months and then i became the ed uh later on in uh that year so um very exciting uh space to be in um but most of my background before from a not-for-profit side was with student governance um where i was running the niagara college student administrative council for two years prior to my role here so tell us about your path i mean you're obviously in a pretty senior position at a, a very young age and you've done a lot what kind of got you wanting to get involved in leadership? Um, you know what? It's one of those things where I think for me, looking at my journey, whenever I talk about it, um, it really starts all the way back to a version of myself in grade 12, um, where I was on the path to sciences. Like my entire um, upbringing, my entire trajectory was um, on the path of becoming a marine biologist of some sort, or I was thinking at the time ecosystem restoration. So I had no intention of one coming to Canada um, and I ended up in grade 12, just having what I consider my first conversation with myself about what is it that you would like to do, enjoy doing, um, and versus what you have the aptitude to do. Because mm -hmm. I think for, for many of us, whether it's our kids or people that we know, we're on a path because that's the, what we're exposed to. And that so happens to kind of create its own set of, um, you know, stop gaps as you kind of go through. And so for me, that was my first moment where I stopped to think in a very nonchalant way um, or kind of silly way. I was like, what would I enjoy doing with my life? Like I've done sciences. I don't see myself being um, in a lab looking through a microscope for the rest of my life. And it was a very somewhat cynical comment about, I think I'm too interesting of a person to be um, <laughs> stuck in a lab. And so that led me on the journey of, you know, the things that I was involved in as a young individual um, that I could turn into a career. And funny enough, my career started out being in the culinary world. 
So I moved from Jamaica to be here in Canada um, to pursue culinary arts. I was going to be a chef. I did that for a number of years. My uh, my diplomas in culinary, my degrees in hospitality operations. Um, so I had zero interest in a, or I didn't have um, a path directly to say I'm going to work in a not-for-profit space. But it's interesting how my my path has evolved from you know wanting to be a chef to having my own food network show to Whoa. getting. Yeah, getting involved with student government during my time at Niagara College, and that really spurred a lot of the community work and uh, advocacy that I was doing both locally and um, provincially. And I think that then led to its own set of, by the time I graduated my degree, I was looking at, oh, I've done a lot of this community work, civic-minded stuff, um, and I was having a real... uh, another one of those life moments of like fork in the road, where do you go? You know, mm-hmm. here I was moved here for a degree um, in a very specific field, adding the pressure of also being an immigrant where for me, it's something I always say, there, there's a different set of sensibilities and uh, pressure that one puts on himself um, when you're not necessarily from, when you're an immigrant in a country, right? You don't feel you necessarily have the freedoms to change your mind at a whim. So for me, there was a lot of pressure and um, imposed on myself, nothing from my parents, where I felt I came here to be one thing, I need to be that. Um, And so deviations from that path really took a while to happen because, or to accept, because I didn't really see those back then as an evolution of self you tend to see those things as failures, right? Like Mm -hmm. I didn't become what I set out to be. So I failed at becoming a chef. I failed at becoming a hospitality professional that was going to, you know, work his way up to director of food and beverage at a large hotel. Um, And so it took those maybe three different moments in my career, my life, where I flipped the switch on seeing the things that I was getting involved in and what doors they were opening up for me and what path they were leading me down to, to be okay with kind of following those paths or opening those doors, even if it's not what the very linear um, idea of where you should be um, was taking you. So my, my road to leadership Niagara and even in the, in, in, in the space has definitely been not something I was planning or was prepared for. Um, But I think it's just one of those key lessons of you're kind of listening to the opportunities as they get presented. Um, Life is kind of happening all around you. And I think many of us, we kind of miss those um, calling and you can have multiple callings, I do believe, um, but miss those opportunities that are primed for you at the time, instead of being very hard and fast about this is what I'm set out to do. And this is what I'm supposed to be based on you know, whatever metric we decided on years ago. Um, So even though I've been in my role for, you know, four years, I feel that it was a very slow burn into even really stepping fully into the opportunity that was provided at Leadership Niagara when I stepped in as an acting role, because that, that juncture in my career as well was one of many, um, Uh, another one of those kind of fork in the road moments. So I had Mm -hmm. a full uh, career and formal education in a a specific sector, in a specific field. And then I had four years, three to four years, four years of uh, post-secondary student government advocacy, community work um, experience. And I was yet then met with, what do I do with this? Like, where do I go as a was budding hospitality professional to somebody that had really got engrossed with um, local transit advocacy and provincial advocacy work for college students across the province. And I didn't feel like I was cut out anymore to be that food and beverage director. Um, Like I just didn't see myself in a very, uh, not cliched role, but just working up the normal ranks of a hospitality yeah. uh, firm and so I was then met with what do I do uh, right. and and I knew part of my the challenge to as a young professional was always navigating the space that we exist in right now um, about 
credentialism, right? So here I was looking at formal education in one thing, mm-hmm. lived experiences in a lot. And I think for, you know, where the workforce is today and where org- leaders of organizations and how we kind of recruit and find people, um, there is this humongous pressure placed on the credentials that one that we have, right? You look at our generation, we're in post-secondary education far longer than most generation, previous generations had to be to get into entry-level positions, right? So it, it, was, it definitely dawned on me as far as, okay, how do you articulate that lived experience to the next role that you should have? And what does that mean as far as transferable skills? And I could tell you, I think even going through that transition, um, there's a lot, I think, that from a, from a leadership standpoint, I think a lot of people still just look for titles, right? They look for the previous roles that you've had in their specific industry and not necessarily look at the transferable skills that really come from those different lived experiences. So, right, I got a lot of no's early on, like, well, you've never, you've never been a manager of a restaurant. I'm like, yes, but I ran a not-for-profit student union with nine senior staff and a eight board of 12 board of directors and the gambit, right? Um, so it was just a very interesting thing to see how people mm. tackled um, or how deep people went in terms of just trying to figure out what leadership skills or competencies somebody has to bring to the table, regardless of whether the credentials itself speak to that or mm. um, the lived experiences that that individual has um, allows them the ability and the capacity to thrive in a unique space right just so, so with senior with with young people right and, and <laughs> i will hear it all the time in my time when i graduated back in 1987 you know uh with an undergraduate degree there was so many options it seemed like there was so many options available to me back then uh shane compared to what the young people coming out today they'll you'll hear them you'll hear people you know like I live in a little town here in Niagara Falls and you know this lovely girl she she um she's at the drive through lovely lovely girl background in psychology has a psychology degree you'll hear all these young people saying education today is not valued the same way and or with your to your point technology is changing so much and there's so mm-hmm. many pressures that and people in my generation say compared to yours you're right we're kind of looking at the you know what what's the initial there mm-hmm. what have you done related to my field and i probably got you know this thick of uh, resumes that i may potentially have to look at to decide who's going to be the person at the top right. of the pile right so what what do you find that with young people out there? What are you seeing when well, you're talking about pivoting, which mm-hmm. I, I'll give you my pivot. I was going to go to law school at Cave Hill and didn't get accepted okay. and decided, okay, I'm going to law. Okay. And then I pivoted and then I went back to grad school and decided to uh, become the psychotherapist. It happens to all of us, right? Oh yeah, sure. You know, um, but going back to young people, what are you seeing out there? Because there's a lot of really highly educated people with a lot of transferable skills that I would think are experiencing a bit of disillusionment because there isn't as much out there or the perception is that they can't get jobs in a particular arena that they're looking in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think the, the context that we're in, the entire generation, 45, 40 under, um, is looking at is because the cookie cutter world of the previous generation where, you know, jobs were as, as described unique to the, you know, I can pluck you out of a post-secondary experience and pop you right into um, a career or a path. Um, I think what we've had to do as an entire generation or learn to do as an entire generation is pivoting, I guess, becomes more of a thing that is required more than a, a happenstance that just, um, you know, comes from whether or not being accepted into a program to it's, it's an intentionality behind, you know, and so I guess to go back to that point quickly, um, I think there's a little bit of a understanding now that the path to a job, secure, unsecured, part-time, precarious, that's a whole different um, discussion, is it's a combination of educational experiences. 
you know, I think prior to the last 15 or so years, it was you go to university stream or you go to college and you kind of step directly into a job. No, the workforce is saying to us that, well, we need you to have the highest level of education possible to get in the door, but we also don't have the time to train or do any workforce development as the previous generation had to, to do as they went into their jobs. So now you have this kind of triaging from college to university and university to college, where it's the average student is, is now navigating both spaces in or by the time they get out to, let's say, pursue a job, which I think compounds the cost of education that it is today. And then it, it's compounded by the, the lack of readily available jobs that really meet those skill sets mm -hmm. right away. So now you have these credentials and very few of the hundreds and thousands of students that graduate from similar programs have an ability to take up a space or a job in that space. And so it does require a little bit of entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship from, from our standpoint as far as taking our careers into our own hands. Um, because for many of us, it's not the one plus one equals two equation that leads us to our career. It's a combination of different things um, and really taking a step back to figure out how you can chart almost your own path or creating your own space in order for those unique combination of skill sets and gifts that you have to be um, a contributing factor to where you go. So people have to work like, to my point, I went to, you know, U of T, I, I graduated 21. I tried to go to Mona, didn't get accepted. I thought, okay, well, I'm going to go to grad school. And then I went to grad school and I did. So, but things kind of lined up in a way. It didn't feel simple back then. Yeah. But what you're, what you're saying today is take someone like me in this day and age, they go out, they get, you know, do the traditional thing. They still would have to be uh, work extra hard to be able to have people recognize their skills, mm -hmm. and they you'd almost have to build a brand in a way. You're oh, talking yeah. about you're building a brand, so you're Shane Malcolm the brand. I'm Roxandra Hodge the brand, mm -hmm. and that's a lot of pressure. I would say compared to when I was going to grad, you know at grad school at 24, I was just thinking, get me a job, get me a job, mm -hmm. right? Um, now you're saying you finish, you're 24, 25, whatever years old. And on top of that, not only have you gone through, you have to still pay your bills, maybe do, yeah. not, do a job just to be able to get by. You have student loan debt, um, those types of things. And by the way, you got to brand yourself because... Yeah, that's, you're, that's, one of, you're one of a thousand other people. Yeah, not, yeah. That, not that that's uniquely different than in previous generations, but I think um, it, it's slightly different in the sense of the volume of people that are accessing post-secondary education Absolutely. now compared to previous generations. So it is somewhat more competitive because the laws of the land now, so to speak, is that you need to go through that channel in order to be successful. Very few people are doing it straight from a high school to success, right? So everybody is being filtered in some way, shape or form through a post-secondary institution um, or combination thereof. So it is more difficult because our institutions are churning out thousands of people within specific fields and, and careers. And I think what is also um, something that as a society we're adjusting to is that we're all living healthier, um, better lives. And so people aren't clearly retiring in the same speed that uh, previous generations uh, have. And so now you're having two generations kind of meet up in the workforce. Um, and how do you, how do you earn it? The big, I guess it takes back that, back to that conversation of how do you earn your keep in a space now where you're like, okay, well, I thought before I had the credentials and I can't have all the credentials and the lived experiences at the same time. I'm either mm -hmm. a master's student or a PhD mm -hmm. candidate. Um, with very little um, work experience, or so how do you how do you navigate that? And I think that's just a quandary that we're all um, trying to wrestle with as you figure out the best way to kind of hustle your way through your 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 chosen career or field. So I gotta I gotta just say it. You know, I listen to you and I I think wow how you've thought this through. 
because you've lived through it and you pivoted accordingly to get where you are. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of young people that are going to say, okay, Mr. Malcolm, um, how do I do it? Uh, I, I'm educated. I've done things. I, I'm doing the part-time jobs and I'm trying to get into my field. Like what, what directions would you give, um, you know, young adults that are getting out there and they're trying and they're knocking on the doors and they're sending the emails and they're networking and they're doing all those things. What have you found that's kind of worked for people that are wanting to get into young uh, leadership roles? Because you, you all are the next generation that's going to take over the, the helm. Maybe we're holding on a little bit too long, but at the end of the day, you're going to take it over. And there's a lot of people out there that are ready, but maybe mm -hmm. they don't know how to kind of maneuver. Yeah. Um, you know what? One of those things is um, it's, it's an interesting thing because I believe this and I, I heard it echoed by Adele of all people once. It was in reference to, you know, I think one of her many Grammy winning albums. Um, and you, for her, she attributed her sex success, whether it is her, what was her first album, 19, she really said it, it was yes, I have talent, I, I'm a great singer, but it was also just luck, like right time, right place kind of combination. And I do think there is a little bit of, or a whole lot of that to play in terms of how many of us are able to really tap into it. Because what, what I look at is every, most people that I know are doing what you're saying, right? You're networking, you're trying, mm -hmm. yes, you could probably say tips and tricks on networking better or sharing mm -hmm. those things, but they're trying to put themselves in those, in those spaces. We're saying to, it's no longer just the A students that are, have this mindset of, oh, I need to be a volunteer. I need to have straight A's. I need to be on all these different things um, because it's in those organic, non- um, specific things that you're doing um, that the opportunities themselves might present. Um, so it's weird to kind of say it's a little bit of, I think, luck and timing has a lot to do with, you know, what doors um, get open. And I think part of that as well is just being open to the things that may not suit what you think your path is, right? So I think the way we're kind of conditioned and we've always been conditioned is success is a straight path. I think that sets us up, everybody, it sets, up, it sets us up for the unrealistic expectations of what life is, right? Life is more of, you know, going upstream, um, you have your, you know, periods of rapids and, and, and so forth. And I think when we paint this uh, picture that it is all a linear approach. You do this, you do this, you do this. It really sets you up for a, a larger downfall or at least the sense of failure because all you've been told is if you go to school, if you do this thing, you do this thing and you graduate with this grade or this distinction, you should get a job. No, you've done all those things that your parents or teachers have required of you and then you're at this juncture of okay, where, where are these opportunities? Why can't I seem to get in? Um, and I don't know beyond what you've already said, and I think beyond what we, we all try to do is to say you do need to, I think it's that knowledge that you can't be just a book smart person anymore. It does require you to build a brand and what that brand is is, in part about you getting out there and being in the spaces beyond what you're, um, whether it's volunteering or, you know, doing projects in the community. Um, I think those things get you in front of uh, more people that allow for maybe organic conversations of, oh, Roxanne, what's your background or what do you do? And, yo, know, I went to school first so-and-so and I'm currently, and those things might organically lead to that because I think the the other part of maybe the what we maybe need to say differently about getting out there it's not about the volunteering perspective it's more about the building relationships right um which i think which i think is the constant here because i can tell you sh you know shane i lived in niagara falls and have been an executive in toronto i have 
taught uh, grad school. I have taught at Niagara College. I have worked at the hospital. And, and I never left Niagara Falls. I mean, once I moved here from Trinidad, mm -hmm. uh, I never left Niagara. And to your point, I think it is really, truly, at the end of the day, relationships. If you mm -hmm. think about how I met you, I, yeah. I, I did some work with Yvonne, and then you were the MC at HR Disrupt. It's all, you're, you're so right. Because I think the one thing that I think is very, very important to, from what I heard you say is success is not a linear line. However, every position that you take, there is skills associated Thank you. Um, that you are gleaning and taking with you, right? Like you're mm -hmm. like, um, I call, you're, building, you're, you're building, you're building yourself up. This is something I said when I, so I recently had the, the honor um, of being the convocation speaker at Naira College for their uh, 2019 fall convocation. Wow, nice. And one of the things I said to them is, as much as education right now, and we talk about, you know, having to go to university and college and, and all that stuff, and you might start out in history and end up in, you know, a different field altogether, is yes, there is an expense that goes to it um, with that. But at the same time, we're all taking pieces of those um, lived experiences or educational experiences that we have into the next role that you have. So when we mm. think about, you know, the term hustling or putting in the time to get better, it's really not about the job that you have at hand. I always say it's about bettering yourself for the, your future role, right? So the, there are things when, and if we ever stop to really think fully, um, and I challenge people to, to do an exercise of kind of reflecting on who you are right now as an individual, maybe the traits and um, things that are not necessarily whether unique about you or that you find are your cornerstone qualities and just try to do a, 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 um, a roadmap backwards of where those, where those skill sets would have come from or being honed or, and what mm -hmm. elements of your life would contribute to you having this persona right now. And it's very interesting because I, I've, you know, people would describe me as very, Metho um, I'm very meticulous and methodological in terms of how I approach things and it, there's a rhyme or reason and an order to how I tend to operate. Um, and you take that back to, you know, my time as a budding scientist, right? The scientific method and your steps and your methodology and you're breaking things down to, you know, being a chef where you're mise en place, oh, yeah. having all your ingredients before you start doing and cooking your meals. Like all those things lead to the version of me right now as an ED that approaches a lot of things. In, but we never stop to think, you know, oh, my time as a chef or my time as um, within this field. Um, for you, your time being a potential law student, um, what those unique insights or um, the the aptitude that is required to thrive in that space what what is that how does that play into the roles that you have now or right. or, even, or even you know I, and i always say that my i i wanted to help people right so i thought mm -hmm. you know i was trying to figure out different and you know i grew up in the caribbean till mm -hmm. i was 16. back then it was doctor lawyer engineer or yes. nurse and yeah. i'm like okay i don't fit any of those and i'm like okay well i like to talk to people and i think sometimes it's even i remember my father and he was you know um a senior director quite young in my life and he was so good with people that when my father spoke to anyone it was like nobody else was in the room so i even think back now and i know i have that quality and i've been told mm -hmm. that and i think here i am i probably was a little toddler flying around looking at that interaction and learning mm -hmm. They're right picking up things yeah right absolutely and i was thinking well that wasn't a skill i learned in school well, i looked yeah. at learned it from my trinidadian culture and and the connection and what i saw my dad do so we're always picking up things right and you know i think that young leaders today and you, i want to pivot back to this because i think of when i became a leader what you're talking about is i didn't have those skills back then mm -hmm. back you know i learned that uh you know when i was in a senior position because I had some, but I, I, I was like, oh boy, here, you know, I've taken this position. What am I doing? And then I learned it. I think young leaders today are coming a lot more equipped to, to the workforce. 
than say someone like me that was in my mid twenties to like late twenties. I, you know, was like taking the positions and it's kind of like, Oh boy, I better be able to fish in this pond. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I stumbled up. Whereas it sounds like the younger generation is coming. They're coming with a whole lot of experiences to the workforce. Right. Right. And so they could hit the, the ground running. So I want to talk about, management and um, hiring young leaders, because mm -hmm. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, people, you know, the, uh, the older generation's kind of not, we're staying a little bit too long, maybe further along. So you're getting that, that cross section of young leadership with uh, senior leadership that's a bit older, right? So when you're hiring new leaders now, what do, what do senior executives um, and CEOs need to think about with, with uh, younger leaders? today when they're thinking about prospective hires? Um, you know what? I think one of, um, I think one of the things that I always find that, you know, it's like, oh, well, as to your point earlier, when we started off, you're saying, well, maybe, you know, some people are thinking, well, we don't understand the, this generation, or we, we don't fully understand um, what they might be looking for. And, that might be true in, in some ways, but I often find that, and I've said this to people before, I'm like the same things that you were looking for when you were my age or starting out in your career or whatever stage you were, those are the same things that people are looking for right now. Those things haven't fundamentally changed. Um, there might be, there is a difference in maybe how this generation is where there are more people that are looking for works that are a career that is fulfilling rather than the mindset. And we come from a Caribbean culture where the overall culture or, or tone towards work is not really one of enjoyment. You don't really hear people <laughs> talking about being fulfilled in what no. they're doing. It's, it's, it's what you do. This is what grownups do. You work, you put food on the table, it's sustenance. Um, so the, the notion of, you know, this kind of fluffy feeling of fulfillment doesn't really make its way into the conversation. And I think sometimes too, when we look, when the current CEOs and industry leaders, when you look at how we're hiring, I think we tend to want to think that we're worlds apart from the next generation, right? And given some of those slight changes, whether it's, you know, there are more people that want to think, I want to find purpose. And that's not only an employee-driven um, mandate or requirement, that's from us as consumers looking to companies that are more than their bottom line, that are more than just what they do, right? So everybody's looking for purpose and deeper meaning beyond, you know, what is it that you're manufacturing or you're producing? So I think one is take getting rid of that mindset that oh well you know this generation is looking to be fulfilled not every role in our organization is going to bring meaning to you or <coughs> tickle that that particular spot and instead see see those future leaders or or people that you're looking to hire as a reflection of the consumer base or the clientele that is out there in the world that are also requiring um more value and purpose-driven and things that aren't for uh, or authentic um, leaders and organizations and companies, right? Mm -hmm. That's not just, um, that's not just a, a, an employee thing. And I think specifically for, for I guess one thing to think about um, is that I think more people on in, in the younger generation, maybe, I don't know, there are no stats on my, on my side to confirm this, maybe equally looking at interviews. I know I do this where an interview is a two-way street. I'm looking, if, as much as I want this job, I'm looking for whether or not you're a good fit for me, whether or not um, your, cult, your value, your culture, your space, your ethos, like all those things are all things that I assess as the other side, on the other side of the table saying, is this a supportive work environment? Do I think there's room um, to, to grow? Do I think there is um, capacity to, um, or interest in that individual saying, 
you know, even within the very restrictive rules that we may have to have in organization, that there's room for individuality, there's room for you to bring who you are. And I think that's one of the greatest struggles of the transitioning industries is we are in, we're literally almost coming from a manufacturing assembly line industry from the past, um, metaphorically speaking as well, where no, the workforce and the people force are demanding or expecting that, okay, well, we are, and I think Bernie Brown says this perfectly, we're here worrying about, you know, robots taking over or jobs and, and canceling people out of um, every single thing and yet or current workplace culture is saying hey Roxanne you leave your individuality at the door and come into our organizational box and just produce don't think don't just do and we're not allowing people to to show up as who they are and allow those unique skill sets to come through because I think that is where the true spirit of entrepreneurship gets to thrive as these individuals say, hey, here's a spin that we can make because this is a passion of mine. This is something I, this is a unique perspective that I bring to the table. Um, so I think uh, leaders right now need to, um, when we're, we're looking at hiring or replacing or themselves, um, there's really a lot of hustling that's there. And I do think each generation gets a bad rep from the previous one, right? <laughs> yes. Everybody has it harder than the, the previous one. And I yeah. think we need to maybe get away from that very black and white conversation of who's had it the worst and just understand the unique set of challenges that are plaguing this particular generation. You don't necessarily have to live it to understand it. There's intersectionality that exists. And I always say, I don't, there's intersectionality between my lived experience as a young black male to the intersectionality of any woman in the workforce. Um, the same things that I do as a mental calculation may be the same things that a young leader or a young female or a woman of color would have to do um, in the same space, right? And we don't necessarily have to all live those experiences, but we can all find an area of intersectionality that allows us to get a sense or to glean a little bit of perspective around um, where that individual may be coming from and what we could do to address that. Does that- uh, you know, And I think, you know, to your point, and uh, uh, you know, nothing against my generation, I think we just did, I just kind of plotted a path mm -hmm. and I, I think what's happening is the knowledge that a young leader, let's say, you know, I was in a position to hire a young leader, you would be challenging me in a way that would have to, I would constantly have to think. And I, and I would have to, of course, what we know in the workplace is that um, presenteeism and assenteeism, um, short-term disability, all those things are rising, right? Mm -hmm. So people want purpose. Mm -hmm. And like, you're right, the man manufacturing mentality that we're coming out of and we're shifting, that's, that's mm -hmm. reality. Technology is driving our workplaces today. It's forcing us to deal with what's in front of us. Like to your point, we're evolving, but there's going to be better along the way. Yes, there's going to be um, deficits, but there's also better. So when I think of my, you know, young leaders, and I, you know, when you talk to young people, they, they want meaning, they want purpose, they want work-life balance, things that I would be like, uh, and mm -hmm. when I was, you know, when I was, you know, uh, you know, in the workplace, it was like, oh, work-life balance. Okay, sure. I'll figure that out later. And now I realize that, you know, had I, at that time, it's timing too, right? I'm talking, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now it's different, right? You know, you have policies in place, you have, you know, digital kind of limitations with, with, you know, texting, all that stuff. So in a way, because we've had this massive shift into technology, it's also forced us to start to look at what's in our best interest of keeping people uh, healthy and happy at work, right? Yeah. And the younger generation is bringing that in and they're saying, well, no, 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 I, I don't want to work the 60 hour week or mm -hmm. I want to be able to work on a project where I, I can leave my, a bit of my footprint. And I, so I think it's challenging uh, the, the workplace in a lot of good ways. Yes, at times there's going to be intersections like to your point where there's going to be conflict based on mm -hmm. um, different uh, you know, generations, but is that not where growth can come? 
Yeah, and and I think too, you know, I I think the I'm a passionate millennial. Like I I wear that word with pride because I feel I'm always defending my age range. Um, you know, we're constantly under attack as far as you know what people say about oh millennials are entitled, millennials are yes, you know yes. lazy and you know don't want to work. And I'm like, yes, but I don't know. Yes, and there are entitled people in every generation. There are entitled people, there are lazy people in every generation. Like, it's not unique to, to us, but at the same time, you say that, and I can find you, for every person that you're, you're entitled, I can find you two or three millennials that are doing three, four jobs that are, you know, also trying to find time to volunteer and do those kind of things. So it, it, it's just a very weird thing if, as industry leaders, we're in our corner saying, well, I know what you guys lack and I know what you guys don't have. Um, and that challenge is seen as, well, don't question, don't question me. I've been here long enough. And like, it's not a question of your um, history and knowledge. It's just a question that may come from a different perspective because I'm an external body to what you've been probably consumed with your entire life. And I look back to um, a, a friend of mine who was partially raised in France. And when he came here, um, he's, he's from St. Lucia, then he okay. went to France to live for a couple of years. And we would always have this conversation about, you know, how French people are, um, you know, seen as very um, to the point and blunt and there's all they're very inquisitive and always asking and when he came here to study he said like he had such a hard time because even basic things I don't even think we're paying attention to the North American kind of culture especially in an education standpoint is not really to question it's mm. to I'm the I'm the institutional knowledge I pass this on to you you take it wholesome and then you go where in, and, I, and we do this in the Caribbean too. There's a lot of critical thinking that happens early on in high school, yes. right? Like, I think critical thinking really becomes a thing here in college, mm -hmm. university. Um, and so you have people that immigrate here from different, um, more stricter educational backgrounds or, um, and anyway, but what he was saying is he noticed that the biggest difference between him living in France and coming to school and, wor and working here is we take what is so commonplace in the French culture as kids are expected to ask why at every single mm. turn, right? The, the high school system is structured in that way. If you're not challenging your teacher in why are you saying this? It's not, re it's not taken as, well, I went to school for this. Why are you asking me why? It right. is what it is. And right, right. we fail to try to sell the why. We just say, hey, I'm the institutional knowledge. I'm the industry leader. Go and do that. And I think that's part, whether that's a complete North American construct um, where we just want people to be tactically informed and just kind of go with the flow. And we see any stop and uh, momentary question of, you know, why as a negative thing where it's a it's an insult to to what I bring to the table clearly you don't need to ask me why because I clearly know what it is and I think our organizational leaders too will have to I mean I think some are definitely getting that on where it's not the leadership versus management thing it's not just saying you need to jump it's a justification of why you're jumping and I think for some it's unpacking that wire um, to not be the, well, I don't owe you anything. You're just the cog in the wheel. And right. if you have that mentality, it's probably off to a wrong start. So millennials really are disrupting us to become more creative and think systemically different yeah. to some degree, yeah. which is what kind of your friend from uh, France was saying. You know, if you're, if you're spurning creativity um, and that's where your brain is. And that's kind of what the millennials have brought to us. Not that we didn't have it too, but we had it more of in a, a traditional way. Mm -hmm. and, and now, and I think of my son who's 18 and I'm thinking, oh boy, what, 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 what are they going to bring? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think it's about saying, 
um, to your point, uh, leadership that are looking at young leaders to say, you know what, this is an opportunity because mm-hmm. I have this young person that has had all this, like to your point, lived experiences and they're, they're wanting different things. They're going to have a different way of thinking that could actually um, impact your leadership out there in your sector, whatever sector you're in. Yeah. Yeah. You know? and I, yeah. And I, and I think the other thing too is um, I think or industry leaders, we, I think, the leadership of all our industries. No, we have to find a way for the workforce to go up, to put a little bit more slack in the waistband for development to happen. Like I think mm-hmm. we've gone too far into the expectation of you need to be the exact model of what I need by the time you end up or get out of post-secondary. And there's not any wiggle room um, they are for um, that empowerment and development, right? And, I, and I've heard this all the time. Well, the workforce is very different or global economy is very different. We don't have the time to stop and nurture anything. So we need people to come in and go, 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 go. And I'm, and, and like, well, you can't really have that because it's, those things don't happen in, in the same space, whether you get the learned experience from an educational standpoint, or you're getting the lived experience from actually doing it. But to say that you need that perfect combination from every single facet, I think is doing or future leadership procurement more harm than good, because we're expecting everybody to be the best version of themselves when you get them. And yeah. there's no patience, I think, in the system anymore. Um, again, heartening back to the factory days where you're taking a high school student um, into a, a factory job, it, the system was built and designed to teach you what you needed to know in order to be a thriving success, right. success in that space. No, we've kind of taken that out of the e- equation and replaced that with the need to be in post-secondary a lot longer. So I think we need to find a little bit more slack in that space to say, you know, how do we then, um, and I don't have the answer for this, um, how do we create that slack in the workforce that allows us to, to give the Roxanne's and the Shane's and the, the other up and comers um, room to- To thrive because to they thrive. need to thrive. So I think, I think, I'll give you an example. This is funny and I know we're probably over time, but when I started my corporate job, it was in Toronto. Um, and like I said, I was like 27 years old. And so I would just, you know, portfolio on, I, I, you know, here I am at this portfolio I'm taking on. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, how am I going to do this? Right. I'm an account executive and blah, blah, blah. And I remember my first renewal and I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? It's a huge <laughs> company. And I remember sitting across from my board, my, my bo- boss, who was lovely, love, I, like, mentoring i think is important here Mm -hmm. and he sat right like here i am i'm overwhelmed it's not that it wasn't over it was just the whole process of going through the the metrics and what was happening in the company and pricing and all that and he sat with me because he knew it was was my first renewal right can't screw the first one up yeah then he (laughs) sat with me and at some as simple as going through cpi and all that stuff and was a multi-level contract and all that and he taught me certain things that just, you know, I knew it, but it was the confidence to get up and sit across from a board to renew a contract. It was, you know, new, um, you know, big company in Toronto. And he basically literally figuratively held my hand before I went into the meeting and then it was fine. And I think that's what you're talking about is like, even though uh, globalization is happening in digital technology, we need to figure out a way to uh, effectively mentor Mm -hmm. um, young people, because we won't be able to retain them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If we don't, if we don't nurture and we don't bring them along with the proper mentorship, and I can think of Richard, and I, I, to this day, I became a successful uh, leader and executive because of him, because he took that time, me mm-hmm. being so young with, you know, kind of, you know, um, small fish, big pond kind of thing. I was overwhelmed. I was, you know, young and I had some education and some experience, but I didn't have a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And at the end of 10 years, guess what? You know, I was, I was seasoned. I was, um, you know, one of the top in, in the arena that I was working. So I think we do have to change the practices even though globalization and the quickness of turnaround is increasing, we mm-hmm. have to go back to some of the basics, to onboarding, 
but using it in a creative way so it doesn't take out from the bottom line. Yeah, yeah. Well, I agree. How, what it's going to like, I don't know, but I think <laughs> any, any leaders listening, they really have to think about it and think, um, you know, this person has done lots of things. To your point, before you made step into, core, into leadership, there were certain things that you brought with them for them to start to look at hiring new leaders from a different lens. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, that's, where, that's where it is because when you really think about it too, we've said um, the entire time we've talked, the cookie cutter um, combination isn't there anymore, right? So mm-hmm. the, the one shot uh, post-secondary education to a job, et cetera, is, isn't really there. That formula doesn't really work as well as it used to. Um, so when you even think about the recruitment side as well, I'm like, well, if we're saying the education combination doesn't work, then the mindset that we have into looking at people also doesn't work, right? Because that cookie cutter expectation of you're going to get these exact same um, credentials um, that you're looking for and not necessarily pay attention to the transferable skills that may be tying these things together, um, that it, it, it goes hand in hand. Like both those things require everybody, every player to really to think outside of the box. Right. And it, I think that the success of any of our leaders right now is probably more so those that are comfortable with that type of mindset um, that are thriving, that are seeing the, the benefits of surrounding themselves or injecting that sense of uh, new generation mentality into their workforce because it's from a non threatening um, perspective. So maybe leaders and senior teams need to think, how many disruptors do I have at the level that I'm sitting? Yeah. Do I have people that go along and go, yeah, yeah, Shane, that's good, that's mm-hmm. good, that's good. Or do I have the Roxanne's that might say, okay, Shane, what about this? You haven't, mm-hmm. you haven't looked at that. Even if it may not be a solution, someone that is diametrically opposed in their thinking mm-hmm. or somebody, like you said, you're, micros- you're microscopic, I'm not. I'm the opposite of you, right? So those Mm -hmm. people challenge you really to get more of a a, a well-rounded kind of team. This, you and I could probably talk a very long time. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's a Caribbean in us. That's it for anybody listening. Uh, Now, Shane, for just, I want you to wrap up and just really speak to any young people that are listening that are, you know, out there in the, you know, they're out there in the trenches, they're doing the things that we've talked about. What kind of words of wisdom do you have for them before we let you go and if people are wanting to get a hold of you in any way, um, you can also tell them uh, where they can reach you. Sure. Um, words of wisdom, the pressure. Um, I mean, it is, I think the, the one thing we have to I, 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 um, kind of live with now is live with a loose framework of where your life is going to go. Right. I think having that very hard and fast black and white approach of, you know, we talked about this very hard line in the sand linear approach won't isn't what's going to isn't cutting it for the majority of us. Not saying people's life don't add up the exact way they've seen it, um, but for the rest of us, the other 98 percent out there um, live, adopt this mentality that you're living with a loose framework of where you're going to go in your life. So it's a general path, but you can bounce around the edges as much as you, you need to. Um, and I think that cushions the, the changes and the pivots and the turns that we need and maybe U-turns that we need to make at some point while we're in that lane without it being the complete uh, disaster or feeling like it's a complete disaster or failure, right? Because you've already given yourself permission that there's flexibility and slack within the path that you're trying to go go down. And I, and I think outside of that, um, we might hear, you know, hustle and put your head down and pay your dues and all those things uh, very overplayed because I know so many young professionals and young people my age um, that are doing those exact same things. Um, and it's really, as I said, I think there's a little bit of luck involved. There's, it's a little bit about right time, right place. Um, and just authentically presenting who you are wh- wherever and whenever, wherever you, you are, um, because it's, it's those things, <coughs> the letters and the, the things, asterisks and stuff beside your name that 
are going to be your doorways into the relationship, not necessarily your credentials all the time. Um, so I think those maybe two or three things would be um, what I would say to people my age or younger that are looking <clears throat> to kind of navigate this cloudy, you know, <clears throat> workforce and life that we're living in um, as a starting point. But I'm sure there's way more profound. <clears throat> So if, if people are wanting to maybe connect and just learn about <clears throat> uh, about Leadership Niagara or anything else that you're doing out there, where, where could people get a hold of you if they wanted to connect? Sure. Uh, from a Leadership Niagara perspective, uh, you can visit our website at leadershipniagara.ca just to learn a, more about what Leadership Niagara is all about, the program that we run. Um, and for me personally, you can find me on LinkedIn, connect with me there, uh, Shane Malcolm. <coughs> and on Twitter, uh, Shane underscore underscore Malcolm. Shane underscore underscore Malcolm. So I'm going to say what I think I took away from today. And, uh, um, you know, I, I, I think I love millennials because they always challenge me. And I'm more of a, you know, kind of put your head down. And mm -hmm. what, what I think I learned today was, Millennials are already taking us into unknown ground, but we need to go there. So we need to listen, observe. We all want meaning and purpose. We've all listened to Shane's point. They don't want any different than we do. So, but they're just doing it a different way. And they're asking and they're challenging because they want to stay, but they want to stay with meaning and purpose. They just don't want to do the 30 years kind of because I'm supposed to. And that's something that I think, um, a lot of people in my generation would have loved to do earlier, mm -hmm. but we had to, we had to grow into it to be able to say, no, I want to challenge that or I want to challenge this. So I think, you know, we have to look the gift of the young leaders and what they're bringing to us. And for senior leaders listening, um, we have to embrace that because we want to retain our top talent. If not, they're going elsewhere and that's they're they're going to be going to your competitors which is something that i know uh most organizations want to circumvent um so for me if you're needing any information you know i'm a mental health and wellness expert i'm a keynote and a trainer and a coach and uh, you can reach out to me at roxanderhodge.com so shane thanks again for your time merry christmas it's christmas eve uh that we're doing this and i'm sure we'll run into each other uh, pretty soon in st Catharines. Yes, we will. Thank you for having me and uh, good uh, luck with all the wrapping that you have to do. <laughs> okay, I have lots. Okay, <laughs> take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.